I remember reading an article a little while ago that said that the US military still save the launch codes for their nuclear missiles on floppy disks. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but bearing in mind the British Royal Navy allegedly still run their submarines on Windows 95, it seemed perfectly plausible. And something struck me as amusing about the ridiculousness of this whole situation. God forbid it should ever happen, but if they wanted to launch a nuclear missile, I had this image of someone in the Oval Office blowing the dust off old floppy disks and inserting them in a disk drive to try to find the right file to load. And that's what gave me the inspiration for this escape room puzzle. So here we have the launch console. You can see it has a floppy disk drive, uh, an LCD display that says insert disk to upload file data, and we've got three indicator lights at the bottom, as well as a rotary select wheel. Now in the room, players discover a number of floppy disks, and these are labelled corresponding to the LED indicators at the bottom. So if we uh, choose any one, let's choose the flight path data to start with. If we insert that into the floppy drive, you can see the screen says it's accessing files, and we now need to select the right file to load from this disk. Uh, now if I choose uh, top secret for example, we'll try to upload that file, but that's the incorrect file, so we just get an error message that the data was corrupt. Um, if we try nav data, we'll get the same error. So those are the wrong files to load from that disk. The correct flight path data to load is actually the one called do not delete. So we'll load that, and when that file has been uploaded successfully, you'll get a message here, and also the flight path LED will come on to show us that we have successfully loaded that part of the data. We can now eject that disk, and we'll load one of the other ones instead. So let's look at uh, calibration settings, for example. Insert that disk. Uh, we'll load the files here. Obviously, we've got different files on this disk, uh, and for this one, it is file 633 that we need to load. When that's loaded successfully, the calibration light comes on. We can now eject the floppy disk. And the final file we need to load is payload info. So we'll insert that finally. And we've got a new set of files once again. Uh, now if I select secret 01, which is the... So if I select any of the uh, incorrect files from this disk, nothing will happen, this will stay unlit. These are locked and loaded in now, so they're fine. But if I load uh, secret01.txt, this is the final piece of data, all three lights come on, and we'll get a message on the screen that says data load complete, ready for launch. And at this point, we could activate a relay, or we could display another message on the screen, whatever you want when the puzzle is complete. Okay, so how does this work? Well, the disks themselves are genuine three and a half inch floppy disks, but I've modified them to remove the magnetic film that would be on the inside, and instead I've inserted an RFID tag on the underneath. Now, if you'd like to have uh, more details about exactly how I did that modification, you can view the last video which I uploaded in this channel, which contains uh, a lot more detailed instructions as to how I did that. And then for the console itself, if I just show you the uh, reverse of that, so I've got a microprocessor. I'm using an ESP32 this time, but pretty much you could use uh, an Arduino Uno or Nano or Teensy or ESP8266 instead. Uh, that is controlling the LCD display. This is a 20 by four character display. Uh, the rotary encoder knob, three LEDs at the bottom, and you'll probably be unsurprised to learn that inside the floppy disk drive at the base there, I've got an RFID reader. Uh, so this is one of those very common blue ISO 14443 reader units. Um, they're literally like $2 uh, anywhere on the internet. And uh, what happens is that as the disk is inserted into the drive, um, the RFID tag that is on the reverse of the disk there, just lines up on the reader and it gets read by the processor. Uh, now, what I really wanted to do was I wanted to use uh, a genuine eject mechanism from a floppy drive like this. So uh, this is uh, from a knackered old PC I had. Uh, so when you insert the disk here, it kind of slots in, you get a nice click, and then you get a sprung eject mechanism. Uh, but when I tried to use this, it didn't work with the RFID reader. Um, this is obviously a large 
chunk of metal and metal interferes with uh, radio signals which is how RFID readers work. Uh, so what I did instead was a much more simple solution. Uh, my little drive here has got a, a slit cut like a groove that the disc slides along um, and it just guides the, the disc in place so that it lines up with the reader correctly and stops at the back plate there. So um, it doesn't have the sprung eject, you simply push the disc in and out. Um, but if I'm totally honest, that spring mechanism in a real life escape room would probably be a weak point that would uh, break anyway if it's used, you know, lots of times brutally. So just having something much more simple where you uh, slide the disc in and out is actually probably long term going to be a better solution for an escape room puzzle anyway. And here's how those components are connected as shown in a wiring diagram in Fritzing. So here is my ESP32 in the center, and if you're not familiar with these, they're programmable microcontrollers, very similar to an Arduino. In fact, the vast majority of code that you write for an Arduino will work exactly the same on an ESP32. You can still use the same libraries, you can still upload code to the board using the familiar Arduino IDE. But ESP32s are based on a more modern, more powerful chip, and that means they have more memory to hold more complicated sketches, they have a faster processor, and they have additional features such as built-in Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, uh, they've got multiple serial interfaces, etc. Now, you could do this project using a regular Arduino Uno or Nano instead here, but it will be pushing it somewhat to its limits, um, both in terms of hardware and software performance. You'll find an ESP32 will do it much more capably and leave plenty of opportunity to add extra features like sending a remote trigger message when all the data is uploaded or interfacing with escape room control software over a local network. Uh, so they're a little bit more expensive than an Arduino, but I think they're well worth looking into if you're not familiar with them. Uh, and that's why I've chosen them as the basis for this particular project. Okay, so uh, looking around at how all the components are connected to the ESP32 then, uh, if we start in this corner here, we've got our LCD display. Uh, so LCD displays commonly come in two different sizes. Uh, there's one that's 16 characters by two characters down, and there's one that's 20 by four. Here I'm using a, a 20 column and four row display. Um, you could use a, a 16 by two instead. They use the same controller and the same library. I just wanted to have a little bit more space to give the choice of what files were available. And I'm using the version that has an I squared C backpack attached to the back of it. So what that means is that rather than going to this set of pins across the top here, I'm simply using four connections. I've got ground, a VCC which is going to 5 volts, and the data and the clock line that are going to the I2C interface on the board. Now on an ESP32 the default I2C connections here are 22 that's going to the clock line, and the 21 pin over here that is going to the data line. But if you're using an Arduino, those are on pins A4 and A5 instead. Like I say, that will work just as well on an Arduino instead of an ESP32, but you do need to use the GPIO pins that are assigned to an I2C connection. Now the RFID reader, which I've got over here, this doesn't use I2C, this uses SPI instead. And again, there are generally certain pins that are assigned to the SPI interface on different boards. On the ESP here, you've actually got two SPI interfaces, but the one I'm using, which is the VSPI interface, uses the GPI pin 23 here. That's for the MOSI line. And then we've got the MISO line, the clock line, and the slave select line here. And note that the reader here is powered at 3.3 volts. It's not a 5 volt reader, it's a 3.3 volt reader. Now that's uh, an interesting thing to mention because that's another reason why sometimes I prefer using ESP32s. When you've got different components like this around the outside like displays and readers and all sorts of sensors, you'll often find that some of them work at 5 volt logic, some of them work at 3.3 volt logic. 3.3 volt logic is generally a more modern design and more new sensors tend to be based on 3.3 volts whereas 5 is a slightly older standard and these readers 
run at 3.3 volts. That means if you want to use them with an Arduino, which natively runs at 5 volt logic, you do need to be very careful not to send high signals that are going to overload the reader here. Now, there's a lot of misinformation and debate on the internet about whether it's okay to wire these um, readers directly to 5 volt Arduinos. Lots of people say it's fine. I've done it before and it's worked fine, but technically when you look at the data sheet, that is outside the maximum operating voltage that you can supply to here. Now the ESP32 runs natively at 3.3 volt logic, and that means you don't need to worry about any kind of logic level conversion or anything to the RFID. You can wire these mozzie meso clock lines direct between these two devices and they are both talking at 3.3 volts. That's absolutely fine. The LCD display, incidentally, the voltage line here, this is a 5 volt voltage line, and that's why I've got connected to V in here. But the uh, data and the clock line, this will run at 3.3 volt logic just fine. So it's being powered at 5 volts, but with a 3.3 volt data interface, that's fine. Uh, whereas the RFID reader is both being powered and its data all at 3.3 volt logic. Now, while we're on the subject of different voltage levels, seeing as that seems to be the theme of this particular project, uh, let's take a look at these LEDs. Now, here I've got my three blue LEDs. They're on the front of the panel and they lit up when the three pieces of data were loaded. Uh, here I've got a green LED, and I didn't really point this out in the video, but this was on the floppy drive bezel, and that lights up when a disk has been inserted. And you'll see, as is commonly the case, I've got a series limiting resistor connected to the anode of each LED, and that is wired to a unique GPIO pin that will drive a high signal and light the LED up. And then the cathode of each LED I've got wired down through to ground. Uh, but what you might notice is that the value of the current limiting resistor I've got is different on the blue and the green LED, and it's also different from you might be used to if you're familiar with Arduino projects. So, Arduinos run at 5 volts, as I mentioned, and this ESP32 runs at 3.3 volts. So what that means is when you write a high signal to one of these pins here, this is going to be at 3.3 volts higher than ground. That's going to be the voltage difference across these LEDs when we light them up. On an Arduino, that voltage difference when you write a high signal to a GPIO pin is 5 volts above ground signal. So we've got a different voltage going through the LED depending on whether we're using a 3.3 volt device like an ASP32 or a 5 volt device like an Arduino. And because of that, we're going to calculate a different value for the resistor. So the formula you use to calculate current limiting resistor for an LED, you take your supply voltage, so that's either 5 or 3.3, you take away the forward voltage across the LED. So this is effectively the, the voltage drop um, across the LED, and that varies for different colored LEDs. So a red LED normally has a forward voltage of about 1.7 volts. A green LED is slightly more. That's normally about 2.1 volts. Uh, a blue or a white LED is higher still. That can be as high as 3.1 volts. So you work out the difference between the supply voltage and the forward voltage across the LED. And then you divide by the forward current. So that is the current you want going through the LED, how bright it's going to light up. And then that gives you the resistor value in ohms that you want to put here. So on a standard 5 volt Arduino with a red LED, which is probably the most common configuration, you're probably used to using a 220 ohm resistor. That's absolutely fine. But here, where I've got a green LED, so that's got a forward voltage of 2.1 volts, and I've got a supply voltage of 3.3 volts, I'm actually using a 68 ohm resistor here. If you're on an Arduino at 5 volt logic, you want to increase that to about 150 ohms instead. 
you always generally round up the value that you calculate to the nearest close resistor value. It won't ever do any harm to choose a resistor that is higher than the calculated resistance. All it will mean is that your LED will not light up as bright, but it won't damage it at all. Whereas if you choose a resistor that is too low, or if you don't include a resistor at all, the risk is that you will burn out the LEDs. You always need to include one here. Uh, with my blue LEDs, so i am got 3.3 volt logic coming out. These are 3.1 forward voltage LEDs. So there's hardly any voltage left to drop across the resistor. Uh, divide by 20 milliamps here, and I'm actually using only 10 ohm resistors in series with here. And then moving on to the rotary encoder here. So this is a cheap rotary encoder switch. And what happens is it's got a ground connection, a voltage connection. Now I'm using 3.3 volts. You'd use 5 volts on an Arduino because what's going to happen is that the signals on these lines here are going to be set based on whatever the ground and supply voltage is. So on a 3.3 volt device, I want the signals coming down these lines to be at 3.3 volts. So I've connected it to the 3.3 pin here. On an Arduino, you'd want the input to a GPIO pin to be at 5 volts. So you connect this to 5 volts instead. And I've got uh, one wire here to read whether the switch has been pressed or not. So when the encoder knob is pressed at the end, that's when we upload a file. And I've got a data and a clock line and that's to read whether the knob has been rotated and whether it's rotated clockwise or anti-clockwise. And here's the code that implements all the controller logic. And this exact same sketch will work whether you're using an ESP32 or an Arduino. The only thing you'll need to do is make a couple of changes to the pins. As I mentioned, the I2C and SPI interface use different pin numbers on different boards. And then you'd also need to go up to the tools menu and select the target board, whether you're using an Arduino, Nano or Uno, or whether you're using one of the ESP boards instead. Now, I did mention this is a relatively complicated sketch. In fact, a lot of that is simply because of the amount of data it's storing. Uh, all of the text strings that need to be displayed on the LCD display, for example, make it reasonably long but actually it's not that complicated logic-wise. Uh, so we'll step through it. I'll just try to highlight any particularly interesting or, or complicated bits that you might get tripped up by. So starting at the top, we've got the external libraries that we're incorporating in this project. So I'm using the wire library. That's the generic library for accessing any I2C devices. And then this is the particular library I'm using to interface with the LCD display. Now, I used to use another library called Liquid Crystal I2C, um, but I've actually recently swapped to using this library instead, which I think is a little bit more extensive in terms of functions, and it also seems to be a lot faster as well. So you can find a link to download it here, but you can also download it from the Manage Libraries function inside the Arduino here. I'm using the very common MFRC 522 library for the RFID reader. Now next I'm going to set up some structures. Now structures are a C language feature. I don't always use them in my code but you might not be familiar with them so I'll quickly talk through them. Essentially when you create a variable like this one for example you're creating a single integer variable you're giving it the value 3 and the name num tags and from then on you can refer to num tags it will be 3 and you can make it a different number you can do calculations with it for example here I've got some uh, other examples I've got an array so this is an array of three different byte values that I've called LED pins and I can refer to the first element in array the second element in array the third element in the array, for example. But here what I'm doing is I'm defining a structure, and a structure is basically like a group of variables that I can keep together and, and treat as one logical entity. So here I'm defining a logical entity which I'm calling a file, and this is my simulation of what the data on the disk is going to be. So I think, well, what 
properties do I want to know about a file that's saved on a disk? Well, I want to know the file name, definitely. So that's going to be a 16 character array. And then I might also want to know the size of the file, and I might want to know the date at which the file was last modified as well. These are things you'd typically see in an operating system about a file. Now, actually in the example I showed in the video there, the only thing displayed on the LCD screen was the file name. But if you wanted to, and I'll show you how later on in the code, you could make that file browser include the size or the date of the file as well, and perhaps players will have to use that information to choose which of the files to upload. Maybe they'll need to choose the most recent version of a file, for example, or the largest one. Um, and we are now able to access all of these properties, the name, the size, and the date of a given file because they're all part of the same structure. I've got another structure here. So this is a card. Now I've called it card uh, because I think of RFID cards. That's what I sort of think of them in my head. But what I mean in the context of this particular prop is a disk. So what do we know about a disk? Well, a disk is going to have a unique ID associated with it. That's based on the RFID tag that was inserted into the base. And that's how we're going to be able to tell which disk was inserted. It is also going to contain some files. So here we have our struct, which is a file. And here we've got an array of four of those files on each disk that we're going to call the contents. So the contents of a card is four files. So you can have sort of structs that contain other structs. And this is how you can make much more complicated storage of types of data than it's possible to get with a, a simple variable like this. I'm also, for each card, as well as saying its ID and the files it contains, I'm going to just have a single reference to say which of those files is the correct file. So in each case, I'm limiting it to only four files. You can make that more complicated if you want, but I didn't think it would be that fun for players to have to scroll down a list of you know 100 files and pick the right one. I'm only going to give them a choice of four, and this index value here is going to say which of those four files is the correct one to load from this disk. Okay, so that's a, a brief introduction to, to structs if you've not seen those before. Uh, then we get some constants. So the constants are variables that are not going to change throughout the duration of the sketch. Uh, this is the number of different disks that are being inserted. This is the number of files that each disk contains. And this is the array of data where we actually define which disk contains what data. So this is the ID, the RFID, that is associated with each disk. If you don't know the tag of any of your RFIDs, you can uh, scan them either with this sketch or with a, an RFID scanner sketch, and it will be the four byte value that is returned to you. That is the unique ID associated with each uh, tag. That's how we're going to identify the disks. And then we list those four files that the disk is going to contain. And remember that a file contains three properties, as it did up here. So we've got the name, the size, and the date. So secret01.txt is the name of a file. It is 100 long. I mean, we'll assume that's 100 bytes in size, but you know it could be 100 anything, basically. I've actually just inserted the value 1 for each of the dates here because as I mentioned I'm not actually making use of the date in the file selector here. I, my original intention was to have it displayed on the right hand side of the file browser but if I did that I'd have to make the file name shorter to be able to actually fit it all on the display so in the end I decided against it but I've left it in there if you want to use it instead you would just add the date that each file had been created here instead and obviously I've inserted some different file sizes for each of these files here as well. So that's my array of uh, information about all the cards. If you wanted to have, let's say, you know, 10 cards which players had to insert, you would simply insert more entries in this array here and you'd increase this value appropriately. Or if you wanted to have more cards on each disk, you could increase this value and insert another element in this part of the array here. Then we define the pins to which all of the different components are connected. So these match 
the wiring diagram which I just demonstrated to you but if you wired your components to a different pin or if you're using a slightly different board you'd obviously update these to reflect where you had attached each of the components to. We then get on to the global variables so these are variables which we want to access uh, throughout the code in all the different functions. Uh, we'll create an instance of our LCD object that we can use to write values to the display. We'll initialize uh, an RFID object as well and we'll use the slave select line that we defined up here. And then we'll keep track of a couple of different variables here all about the state of the puzzle essentially. So the first one is as of right now is there a disk in the drive or not? That is disk present. If there is a disk in the drive, well then we want to know which disk it is. So what is the index of the currently inserted disk? Uh, it's minus one here because we haven't actually got a disk inserted at all. Otherwise that will take a value starting at zero and going up to a maximum of the total number of cards that are being used. If there is a disk present and we know uh, which disk it was, what is the selected file at the moment on that disk? So as the player has scrolled up and down the list of files which is the one that the cursor is currently hovering over. And also uh, rather than constantly check whether a disk has been inserted we're actually going to insert a little bit of a delay. In one sense that simulates the action of the processor actually reading the disk. And initially when I wrote this code I didn't incorporate this. I had the LCD display the file content as soon as the disk was loaded but that actually didn't look very convincing because normally on a PC you'd have to wait for it to scan the files. So I now have a, a slight delay and then it shows that progress loading bar and I'll show you how I implemented that as well before it displays the, uh, the file listing. So that's what that's for. And finally we want to keep track of which of the three uh, disks have had their data successfully loaded so far. So again we've got an array here and it's an array with the number of values corresponding to the number of uh, disks worth of data we're going to load. Then we go into setup. So setup first of all we start the serial connection that's only required for debugging but it is always useful to have and it doesn't really cost anything to have it in your code so you may as well put it there. We'll initialize all of the pins we're using. We've got our input pins from the rotary encoder. We've got our output pins that are used to light up the LEDs. Then we start up the I2C interface, which is using the uh, LCD display. Start the display. Uh, this is because I'm using a 20 column and four row display. If you wanted to use one of those 16 column, two row displays, you'd change these two variables uh, appropriately. All right, now this is the next interesting bit. So you'll have noted in the video, hopefully, uh, when you insert the disk and when you try to upload a file as well, you get a neat little kind of progress loading bar appear on the LCD display. And this is actually an idea I saw in another video, which I thought was really clever the way they did this actually. LCD displays, as well as having a built-in character set for all the letters of the alphabet and the numbers, also have the ability for you to define a certain number of custom characters that you can add. And some people use these to add foreign language characters, so you can have accented characters, for example. But here what I've done is I've added some custom characters that define a bar graph. Now, uh, you can use a total of eight custom characters on one of these LCD displays. I'm actually only using seven so I have got one left over if I want to use it for anything else. But what I've got here is an array of seven by five values because that's the size of each character on these displays and these ones and zeros define whether a pixel is turned on or off at that particular row and column and these values here define basically all of the elements required to draw a little progress bar. So this is the left hand side of the bar and that's if it's empty. This is the left hand side of a bar if it's full. Then I've got three for the middle of the bar which can either be totally empty, totally full or halfway in between. And then I've got the right hand end of the bar empty or full. Now 
if this looks like you know ridiculous amount of binary zeros and ones data don't worry you don't actually have to do this manually and I didn't you can use this tool up here from Quinapolis who also makes the excellent cat word program incidentally and you can basically draw a picture of what character you want the display to show and it will give you the binary representation that you can copy here and then you can use this create char function to actually upload it to the LCD. Now from then on it will get uploaded to one of these eight index slots for custom characters and you can refer to it by a number. So whatever character you've loaded into the first slot you can then call lcd.write byte zero for example and that will print whatever character you defined here. Uh, so it's very neat uh, actually this is this is quite clever like I say this is an idea I saw of a chap called Fabian uh, who wrote a blog article in French about it but I thought it was very cool so um, yeah it's based on that. Then we display a little bit of prompt to the player to let them know what they have to do they have to insert disk or upload file data each of these set cursor lines here so this is an x y coordinate position so we're going to print starting at the left hand end of the second line down this prints at the left hand end of the third line down for example um, and you can obviously modify these to space this as you want if you want to change the message here and you want to center it or right align it things like that you could do that by modifying these set cursor commands here we'll initialize the RFID reader and then we are done with the setup so then we go into the main program loop so this is the function that runs over and over and over uh, for as long as the controller is powered up so what do we do well the first thing we do is we need to check whether the rotary knob has been turned now we do this on every frame even though we actually only take any action based on the rotary knob being turned when there's a disk present we read the rotary knob even if there isn't a disk present because we want to make sure that we don't accidentally miss the fact it's been turned effectively the way this read rotary function works and I'll show you it briefly now I was going to show you at the end but I'll show you it here so these rotary encoders they're sort of simultaneously very clever quite simple but also quite complicated to understand devices it's essentially a series of sort of gates that alternate between going low and high but they're slightly displaced from each other so the order in which they go from low low to low high or low low to high low or low low to high high lets you know whether the knob is being rotated clockwise or counterclockwise and there's several different ways you can read this i used to use a library uh, by paul stoffregan called encoder which is a great library but it does require you to use pins with interrupts and that limits your choice of which pins are available now I'm just using a, a simple digital read of the two wires that are going to the clock and the data line. But I'm using this rather clever code which I got from here. And what this does is it basically rejects any reading that comes from the encoder that does not represent a valid transformation from the state the encoder was previously in. Okay, so as you move this encoder around it transitions between certain states of high and low of these two wires but if you uh, you know if you do it logically there should only ever be certain transitions occur and the way that the encoder library gets to this so this uh, monitors an interrupt that triggers very quickly or instantaneously every time a state change is detected to make sure you never miss one the way this function does it is a slightly different approach that this one actually just uh, checks when it gets a new state that it was a valid change from the state it was at previously and it does it in a rather clever way that involves bit manipulation here and here and then it compares it to the list of valid uh, transformations that can happen here and then it keeps track of the most recent thing now this is quite complicated and I'm going to do a very bad job if I try to explain any more than that so I'm just going to leave it here and give you the link to where you can read more about it but what it means is that at the start of our loop function we're going to call read rotary on every single frame uh, 
whether we do anything with that value or whether we discard it doesn't matter because we want to always know that we know the current state of the rotary knob so that when we read it again in the future we'll know whether it's been rotated clockwise or counterclockwise. There we go. Okay. So we've done that. Now what we need to do is we need to start looking at the floppy disk drive and working out uh, what's going on there. So first of all we'll check whether enough time has elapsed since the last time we checked the floppy, whether a new floppy has been inserted or not. If so, update our uh, timestamp of when the last scan was done. This line here checks whether any RFID tag can be detected in range of the reader, and if so, are we able to successfully read the ID from it? If so, we're going to light up the green LED with a high value to that GPIO pin just to make it light up. If there wasn't a disk previously in the drive, but now there is, that means that something has just been inserted. And what we're going to do then is we're going to display a message on the LCD screen that tells us what the ID tag of the disk just inserted is. So we'll create a little string here and we use sprintf to write into this character array. This uh, format here, this looks a bit complicated, but what this basically says is to write a zero padded hexadecimal representation of these four bytes from the RFID um, tag. So this is what makes the values look like the values we wrote at the top. So things like A17C049, which are hexadecimal values uh, but we're going to write them out as a character string basically so that's what this format string does here. We'll also write it to the serial output just so we've got some little uh, debug information and we will write to the LCD screen, aha a disk been inserted, this is its ID and we're now accessing files and this is where we're going to draw for the first time our little progress bar which I mentioned using those custom characters. So we're going to count from percent is 0 and while the percent is less than 101 so we're going to count all the way from 0 to 100 we're going to show a progress bar that represents that percent value on the third line down it's going to be 20 characters wide so it's going to fill my 20 character display and it's going to start from the leftmost uh, column on the third row down if I show you what that show progress bar function does, that's down the bottom here. So here we go, and here is a link to uh, this blog by a chap called Fabian, which I mentioned, where he describes how he used the custom characters to create this bar. It's actually rather similar to a function I used a few projects back. I was using an LED strip that had sort of smooth blending at the beginning and the tail end of, a, of an LED bar that moved down an LED strip. This essentially works in exactly the same way, it's just that rather than a bar moving down an LED strip, it's a bar moving across an LCD display. Same idea though. So first of all we work out how many columns in the bar need to be uh, coloured in and we do that by mapping the desired percent value to the width of the bar. We take off two from it because each of the characters in the middle of the bar is able to display two characters but the first and the last characters can only display one so we've got uh, two less characters in the display than um, it sounds like we should have based on the number of columns we're using. And then we draw each section of the line based on that calculated value of how many columns need to be filled in. So if no columns need to be filled in, we write the zeroth custom character. And from our array of bytes that we defined up here, uh, remember that I said the zeroth custom character here, the very first one, is the start of the bar and it's empty. So that's what we write to the... here we go. Uh, that's what we write here. If there is basically no percent to display, we're just going to write an empty bar. If there is at least one column going to be filled in though, we're going to fill in the left hand bar so we write the next custom character instead and having done that we've got one less character to fill in so we decrease the counter by one. Now we actually fill in the last segment of the display next 
so what we're going to do here is we're going to go to the end and we'll work out well have we still got characters remaining to be filled in when we get to the end of the bar if we have then we'll fill in the filled in end segment if not we'll fill in the empty end segment and then what we do is we fill in every other column in between based on whether we want it to be uh, completely filled in half filled in or empty so it's kind of a neat function uh, it's worth if you're interested in finding out how you can use that in other um, projects stepping through this a bit more slowly to, to see how this works because it's kind of quite neat actually um, but it's a reusable progress bar that's able to show any value of any width line and starting at a specified X and Y position on the LCD display so it's kind of kind of neat that's what we're going to do when the new card is inserted we're going to show a progress bar of the files being loaded obviously that actually doesn't do anything it's all for show the files are available immediately as soon as the RFID tag is read but it's all just to try to convince the player that something is happening and then we need to decide which card it is that has been inserted. So we know that a card is present because we're able to read the serial value up here. Now what we're going to do is compare that to our known list of cards. And we defined that in our card list array, which we put in the constants right at the top of the code. Um, where do we put it? Here. So... Here is our array of known cards and the files that they contain. And what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the UID property of each card in the card list array and compare it to the ID that we've just read. So this is the value of the RFID card that is currently in the disk slot. This is the value of the RFID of each of the cards in the card list array which we're going to loop over using this I value here and we're going to use memcomp to compare any differences between them. If memcomp equals zero that means they're exactly the same as each other so we have found the element from the array that matches the ID uh, of the currently inserted disk. And if that's the case, that we know that the iteration through the loop we're on at the moment, so the index counter i here, is the current card index. At that point, we can show the contents of the card, and we can also draw the cursor on what the selected file of this card is. If, however, we get to here, so this if here relates to if the disk is present, but we were not able to find it anywhere in this uh, array that's where we are here so that means that somehow a player has managed to jam something into the floppy drive slot that has an rfid tag on it but it's not any of the ones that we wrote at the top of the code so this shouldn't really happen but i thought i'd include it as a as a case just to demonstrate how you'd deal with it um so i've just written on the screen disk not recognized and then we've uh, blanked out the rest of the screen. But just to explain, that's what that case is there. Now what we've got here is that the disk is uh, not inserted anymore, but it used to be. So the if isk disk present value here is true, but this line here is no longer able to detect a card and read the serial number. So that means that the disk must have been removed. So we'll just print that to the serial monitor and we'll update the LCD screen uh, again. And we'll uh, tell the tag to stop broadcasting, tell it to go into halt mode, and we'll also stop the reader. Okay, so the statement here, what we've got here, so this is, we've got a disk, we're able to identify which disk it is, has the knob been rotated at all? If so, we'll update what the selected file is. And we don't want to uh, select a file more than there are the number of files on the disk. So we'll use the constraint function here just to make sure that that is limited uh, to the total number of files on the disk. So it never goes lower than zero and it never goes higher than the number of files. And then we'll show the cursor at that file as well. If the button is pressed in the middle of the encoder, well, that's when we're going to upload the currently selected file. Uh, so I'll show you the upload function. Uh, upload function is 
down here. So this is rather similar to the accessing files when a disk is first, first inserted. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to display a little message saying that we're uploading and look at this, this is rather nice. So we're going to look at the array of cards in the card list and we're going to choose the element of it that corresponds to the current card. We know what that is because we just found that in the loop function. And then we're going to look at the contents property of that card. Remember all those structs we defined at the, the top of the code here? So the contents contained an array of files. Well, which file do we want? We want the selected file from that array. And then what property of that file do we want? Well, we want the file name. But again, if you wanted to here, let's say you could uh, upload the file name, the file size and the file date, you could print those to the LCD as well, very simply by changing the property at the end here that you're accessing of that file. And again, we're going to display a progress bar of that file being uploaded. So just as we were showing the, the progress bar when the disk was first inserted and we were enumerating the files on it, here we're going to show a progress bar showing the data being uploaded. And this is where we take action depending on whether it was the correct file or not. So if the selected file at the point the upload button was pressed matches the correct file ID for the disk that is currently inserted, then we'll update the array to say that data loaded for this card is true. We'll light up the blue LED on the front of the panel uh, showing that this piece of data has been loaded and we'll also update the LCD to display that information as well. Or if we chose the update function but the selected file was not equal to the correct file ID for this card, so we chose one of the wrong files, in that case we'll update the array to say that this piece of data has not been loaded yet. We'll turn the LED off if it was already on and we'll update the LCD display to say uh, this file was corrupt, you chose the wrong file. And then we'll just delay a little bit, I've put a three second delay here just to give chance for players to actually read that message before it gets blanked again. And then we'll simply return to the file list after having uploaded a file. Uh, so then we go, that was the upload function. Um, so we'll now go back to loop, so here we were back in loop. So if the button is pressed we upload the file. There's an else here which I've just inserted an empty else just in case you wanted to add any logic. At this point here this is what happens when the loop function doesn't detect any disk at all but there's actually nothing to do at, at this point so I've just left that empty. And the final thing that we really need to do is to check now whether all of the data has been uploaded or not. So the upload function we just called there uploaded and set the value of one of the elements um, of the all data loaded array. And now we're going to see what well, have all of the elements of the data loaded array been set to true? Have all of the pieces of data been loaded? That's what we're going to do here. We're going to loop over all three of the elements of the data loaded array. I hard coded the value three there, but I really shouldn't have done. What I should have written there is num tags because that will have looped over as many different tags as you want to read. That was very naughty of me, I shouldn't have done that. So we're going to loop over however many elements there are in the uh, data array. If any of them are false, then we know that all the data loaded must also be false. So that's what we're doing here and we can break out of that loop. But if we go all the way through it and none of them have been false, then we know that all data loaded must be true. And if that's the case, the puzzle effectively is complete. All of the items of data have been loaded successfully. We'll display a message on the screen saying data load complete, ready for launch. And this section here is then what happens from then on. So at this point, I've not included this because I don't want to kind of uh, force your thinking into how this can be used. You could simply display a message on the screen that gives a code or a combination for another lock or just an instruction as to what players have to do next. You could trigger a relay that opens a mag lock to a new area or a compartment. You could send a message to your room escape 
software to um, trigger some light or sound or visual effect, whatever you want really, you know, go nuts. But this is the section of the code where you would write any of that logic to trigger the payload uh, when all the data has been successfully loaded. And that is the end of the loop function. So the only other things I've got to show you is a, a couple of little helpful functions that were called up there. The first one shows the file list for a given card number. And there's not much to this really. We loop over all of the number of files on this card. We will print them to the LCD display. I'm using this line here to create a character buffer and I'm writing to that character buffer just the file name of the selected file from the current card. But if you wanted to, you could include the date or the modifier or any other information you wanted to attach to that struct about a file. You could, you know, add the user that last saved the file, for example. That might fit quite nicely with the narrative of this theme or something like that. So we'll write that into this character in the line. And then we write that line both to the serial monitor just for debugging and also to the LCD display. Notice here that I'm not printing it all the way on the left hand column. I'm actually putting an offset of one column, starting one column in. The reason for that is because the very left hand most column of the display is where I'm going to show the cursor of which file has currently been highlighted. So here I'm using lcd.setCursor0, so this is going to be the, the very left hand most column. And if the line number that has been uh, highlighted is equal to the current line number, I'm going to just insert this little symbol here. So this is what's going to be inserted at the left hand most end of the selected file. If it's not the selected file, then I'm just going to put a, a blank empty space there instead. There'll be nothing to see. Um, and then we get into upload, which I've already shown you. So yeah, there's quite a lot there, um, but hopefully that made sense and I've tried to point out what I think are the interesting bits about it, yeah. So that brings me to the end of this video. I hope you found it useful, informative, or maybe just gave you an idea of a new puzzle that you could use in an escape room. As always, I'll be putting the code and the wiring diagrams and also the 3D models that I printed for the floppy disk bezel and the rotary knob and the disks themselves. I'll be putting those over to download over on my Patreon account, which I'll link in the description below. As always, I want to say thank you so much to all my Patreon supporters who very generously enable me to create these tutorials every month. So thank you all ever so much. I really do appreciate your support. If you want to check out more of my escape room projects, please do look at the other videos in this channel. Uh, or if you want any comments or suggestions about uh, this project, please do write them below and I'll do my best to get back to you. Uh, otherwise, I just want to say all thank you very much for watching and I look forward to seeing you next time. Okay, cheers, bye.